Hello, Shockers, and welcome to the Student Government Association's virtual town hall. My name is Mackenzie Haas, and I am your student body vice president. Today, I have the pleasure of hosting Nancy Loosley, Assistant Dean of Students and Director of Student Involvement, Alicia Sanchez, Director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, Kevin Conda, Associate Vice President of Student Auxiliaries and Director of the, of the Radigan Student Center, Matthew Prey, Director of Dining Services, Scott Jensen, Associate Dean of Students and Director of Housing and Residence Life, John Lee, Director of Campus Recreation, and David Miller, University Budget Director. Thank you all for joining SGA again today in hopes of addressing student concerns and issues on our student experience this fall as we all navigate our roles and responsibilities during the up upcoming fall semester. You've sent us several, you've sent us and several members of the president's executive team of the university emails regarding tuition and online fees, and we have heard and shared those concerns with Dr. Golden, Dr. Muma, and Dr. Hall. It is our understanding that Dr. Glenn May, who serves as the Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs, has begun responding to those emails that you all have sent. Please feel free to continue emailing us about this as well. Any further questions will be elevated to administration. We will continue to advocate for students and feel free to reach out to us for any other issues. Thank you for your outreach thus far. For those of you tuning in with us, welcome, and we will go ahead and start with a few general updates from our panelists. Nancy Loosley, if you'd like to begin. Yeah, so um, what we've been working on over the last, I'd say a few months, is really trying to plan for the fall. And so our updates are trying to figure out what events we can do in person, how do we move them virtually, um, if we do them in person, how do we um, ensure or do our best to ensure the safety of those who attend? Um, and then also working with student organizations has been a big part because we're getting a lot of questions from our student organizations of how are they going to do events, how are they going to function in the fall. So we've been able to address those concerns and questions. Um, we've been working a lot with our Greek community, our fraternity and sorority life community, and um, helping them plan for the fall, but also some of them have chapter facilities. So how do we best help them navigate um, when they also have students living in those facilities? So. A lot of just planning um, in a very uncertain time and doing our best to guide the students that we work with. Awesome. It sounds like a lot's going on with student involvement. Thank you, Nancy. Alicia, would you like to go ahead and talk about what the Office of Diversity and Inclusion has been up to? Yeah, so it has been a busy summer for us. We've missed being able to connect with students, of course, like many areas um, on campus. We've um, also, similar to student involvement, have been planning for the fall semester, evaluating our programs, our diversity lecture series, um, and our support groups, and what those all look like, and how we can safely bring everyone together. So in addition to planning for fall and getting things ready, um, a big key program that has uh, we've been really focused on is Passage to Success our pre-orientation program. And so really um, coming up and finalizing details to safely bring students to campus early, to make sure they have the best experience and getting them connected to resources on our campus and of course in the greater Wichita community. And so what that looks like, um, unfortunately because of COVID, we've had to reduce the number of students we're able to bring to campus, but still really excited to be able to provide a hybrid experience that will be robust um, to welcome new students to Shocker Nation. Um, we've also done a significant number of conversations. Um, there's a bit a lot happening in our local community, in our country, um, with um, social unrest and the injustices. And so having conversation and dialogues to help our faculty, staff, um, and students, of course, to really help process what's been happening, being in a virtual environment and having conversations and checking in on students is certainly a priority for us. And so um, we've been busy continuing to connect and do outreach to our student population and preparing for fall. So excited to be able to bring people back safely um, and of course planning for what masks look like and what our space looks like as well for ODI. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Alicia. That's really great work. Um, Kevin, would you like to give us a little bit of an update about the RSC? Oh, I think you're muted. Kevin, I think your microphone is muted. And they told me to make sure I unmuted it. So um, thank you for being a, let me be a part of this this afternoon. Um, the Radigan Student Center, we've been busy, had a busy summer. We've been open since um, about May 23rd. 
um, open to the students and, and open to the public. So kind of kind of going through that process and how do we open safely for the fall and putting those plans together. What does each area look like? What does the soccer sports grill and lanes look like for fall? How do we serve students down there? How do we open the bowling lanes for students? What does um, event services look like? How do we open meeting rooms and follow social distancing and what kind of capacity those meeting rooms will have as we get into the fall? Um, what does your shocker store look like? Um, you know, when we're trying to bring students in for the fall and and what and not having the crowds in there at all at one time and how do we spread that out? How do we move some to online options? Those kind of things when we're doing it. Along with the shockers card center, um, again, trying to get students in earlier, um, trying to see how we handle the, the workload of students there to get get their cars before um, before school starts again so we don't have all those in. So basically just trying to come up with a plan that allows the access to the Radigan Student Center and still keep students safe as we go forward. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Matt, do you want to go ahead and give us... Oh, it looks like we lost Matt. We'll just go ahead and go to uh, Scott if you want to give us an update on housing and residence life. Sounds good. Um, as Kevin mentioned, really safety is at the forefront of all of our minds. Um, and especially here in housing, uh, we're really looking at um, how to help students who may need to quarantine based off of Kansas Health, the Kansas Health Department guidelines and how to help get those folks in um, and get them acclimated, um, but also still provide them great service as they make that transition here to Wichita State. Um, we're also looking at um, our policies and procedures um, for how we're going to work with students if they were um, to become ill and whether they test positive for COVID-19 or just need um, a little space to themselves if they get sick and, and don't want to gather sick around them. So really looking at um, the best ways possible um, for us to give our students a great experience um, while they're here, but also um, help them when they're feeling um, stressed or worried about um, COVID and other things related to that. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. If we could just hop on over to uh, John with Campus Recreation for an update. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm happy to say the Heskett Center has been open since June 1st. We spent a lot of the early summer um, looking at how to open our building safely. Um, all our activity areas are currently open, um, but you will notice when you come to the Heskett Center that a number of the areas have uh, number participant limitations teach space, um, but in the summer, there's been plenty of spaces so far. Um, like most places on campus, you have to wear a mask when entering the Heskett Center or staying in our common areas, but you can remove your mask once you get to the um, activity areas. Um, and just like everybody else, we've been thinking and planning for the fall. Um, and in regards to intramural sports, we're gonna start the intramural sports season in August through September running mostly individual and dual events like tennis and bowling and maybe some special events like punt passing kick competitions and so on. Um, we'll reevaluate um, later in the semester to see if we can move into officiated sports, but we're gonna start with just uh, individual sports that aren't officiated. Um, club sports, uh, club teams can practice right now we're still working with the university to see what travel and games will look like if they are even gonna happen. Um, so stay tuned for that. And with special events, just kind of like uh, Nancy, we're, a number of them have been canceled, but we're gonna run a few of our events so where we can socially distance, like our rec fest, which we've moved to outside and it's just really about tabling and uh, things that we can do one-on-one -on -one with our uh, customers that come see us that day. So that's the update for Campus Rec. Awesome, thank you, John. And then can we have an update from David Miller on our budget? Hi, everyone. Um, you know, uh, for uh, the budget office, we just wrapped up completion of the fiscal year 2021 budget. And even though the president make a lot include 2% across the board budget reduction for every area of the university, which totaled about $2.6 million, um, as well as unfortunately a tuition rate increase of about 2%. Um, we feel like we're gonna have a pretty good foundation now for fiscal year 21. 
And for the budget office, we're always real in reality looking a year ahead. So we're starting to work now on the fiscal year 22 budget. And uh, we've gotten some uh, initial information from the governor's office in the state that uh, most likely we will be looking at some additional cuts on the state side. Uh, so we're trying to work through those. And um, I think some of the questions later on in today's session will we'll, we'll kind of touch on more information that we have in relation to the state. Uh, but that's really where our focus is right now is starting to look at fiscal year 22. Okay, Thank perfect. Thank you, David. All right. Um, before we get started, I just want to reiterate to please feel free to ask any questions or concerns you may have in the comment box. Oh, Matt's with us again, so we'll go ahead and let him give his update on um, on dining services. Go ahead. And so sorry about that. Uh, dining services. So we've got a lot of things new, and fresh to keep students healthy and safe. Um, we're going to be putting a lot of parameters around cleaning and ensuring that our, our space is taken care of at a very high level. Um, we're gonna be welcoming students back with barriers in between our cashiers to also make them feel very safe. We're gonna be encouraging social distancing and masking up. Um, so a lot of what we're doing is gonna be similar with in regards to our quality of food and our beverages. We're just gonna be doing it in a new way to keep our students, faculty and staff and guests very safe on campus. Awesome, thank you. Okay, I just do want to reiterate for our students watching at home that you, you can ask questions or comments or concerns in the comment box. We'll try to ask those questions live if time permits. Um, SGA has also provided a way for students to submit questions prior to going live. So we will take some time to answer those as well. But before we, well, let's just get into it. Um, so for student involvement, our, our first student question is, what can we expect for student organizations to look like in the fall? St events for student organizations, I'm sorry. Yeah, so we met with, um, we had a forum a couple weeks ago on July 9th to talk a little bit more about events for student organizations. Um, one caveat I wanna put out there right at the beginning is this is ever evolving. Um, as we see with the state and the county continually having to make updates and changes as we're going to guide our student organization, organizations as best we can when it comes to the guidelines that they need to follow. And so overall, we are encouraging all of our student organizations that you can have events. There's nothing that precludes you from having events, um, but that we ask that you really look at um, how do you um, ensure the safety and health of those who attend your events or meetings. Um, that you're following um, social distancing, that you're also wearing masks um, where needed and following, right now it's a mandate. Um, and so that you're looking at the health and safety um, of the um, of attendees. Um, we're also asking things like food um, and we've worked, we've had several discussions with dining services about food. Um, and we're really encouraging student groups to um, do a lot of prepackaged um, food and if, uh, you do want to have more hot food there that you are looking at possibly having them serve it rather than um, students or attendees dishing it up themselves. Um, and so making sure that that uh, safety is there um, and that way you're looking with events, the indoor events that you're following capacity. Um, and I will say capacities have changed across campus. Um, and so to check with event services, if you're reserving through them or whether it be through the Metroplex, or through any of the other innovation campus that you're checking with those that you are reserving from so that you can see what their capacity is. Um, and that is still you're advising with mass and social distancing. For outdoor events, um, there isn't necessarily an um, attendance number that you need to follow as far as um, maximum attendance, but still that you need to practice social distancing and mass. I do wanna clarify one thing that we get questions for last week we met with the general counsel uh which state to talk a little bit more about events and a lot of people we have seen recently that um, the county went from 45 down to 15 when it came to um, number of people at events and i just want to clarify that doesn't mean the maximum number at events um, from what we got um, told is it really means that you can have 15 people of commonly known people um, and then with those 15, they have to be six feet, of pe six feet apart from the next group of 15 or three or five. Um, and so there's not necessarily a capacity 
beyond the venue capacity, but that 15 number doesn't mean that it's the total at the event. It just means that those have to be commonly known people in a group and then they have to be um, spaced six feet apart. Um, and so just want to clarify that. So um, with off-campus events, we're just asking that you again follow capacity guidelines for whatever venue that is and that you're um, following the mask and social distance guide guidelines. Um, and then with fundraisers, because we know a number of our student organizations do fundraisers, that you're really looking at more of a kind of a grab and go or pick up um, options so that people can um, still help and support, but we're not necessarily gathering people, um, especially with food that is a little bit more challenging when it comes to social distancing or masks. So and there's a whole bunch of guidelines. Those are some of the highlights. If you have specific questions, please reach out to us. Um, and we can do our best to address them, but knowing that this is an ever-evolving situation, but um, student organizations certainly we encourage you as you feel comfortable um, to have events, whether it be in person or virtually, and we're here to help you and guide you through that process if you need ideas or help. Awesome, so, thank, thank you. you. Another I question had was what, what do you expect events for student involvement to look like in the fall? I, your, your mic is muted. It is? No, you're good now. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, like, <laughs> okay. so like a lot of other people, we are um, trying to figure out what the fall looks like um, as the situation continues to evolve. Uh, and so we are planning some virtual events, some in-person events. Um, what our events are going to look like if they are in-person are going to be very different. Um, just because we've got to make sure that we're following capacity guidelines or mask and social distancing guidelines. And so we are um, going to send out some information. We're working on a more of a in a calendar, a virtual calendar. And then through our website, we'll have that information through our social media, have how we're going to be doing these events. Um, and so that you can follow us on our social media because that's if things change, as they often do in this time that we will put out the most up-to-date information if we have to go virtual for event rather than doing it in person or if we have to cancel it for some reason and we can't move it virtual. So I'd say we're probably like a lot of other people just trying to figure it out and doing our best because we want to offer these opportunities for students because we know it's important um, and we are committed to doing that. Awesome, thank you. So kind of on the same lines, Alicia, what can we expect events with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion to look like in the fall? Yeah, thanks, Mackenzie. Um, right. So again, similar to as Nancy explained with student involvement, um, we our plan is to make sure that we're still providing events. So we're evaluating what can we do um, safely and taking in the health considerations in person. So looking at in-person, virtual events, and hybrids. So anything that we are doing in person, we're making sure that we have a backup plan to be able to offer it in a a hybrid or a virtual experience. You know, certainly we understand that our students um, want a, a collegiate experience. Diversity and inclusion is a core value of the university. And so it's really crucial for us to be able to continue to provide opportunities for discussion and for learning. And so again, making sure that we take into consideration social distancing, room capacities, um, wearing masks and having discussions um, safely. And, and some of the things that we do, right? We love to celebrate and have our food fun and fabric type celebrations on campus and those things as we partner with the student organizations and some of the guidelines that are, are coming out from student involvement on their events, making sure again that students are following those things. We um, acknowledge that for our um, racial and ethnic minority population, um, COVID is impacting that population. So our Black, African-American, Hispanic, Latino population at greater numbers. And so we have to be cognizant of that and make sure that we're, we're mindful and balanced um, those things. So certainly as, for an example, with passage to success, making sure that we're bringing people together. Some, certainly we can't do everything in person and what is in person isn't going to look like the same. So again, reducing some of those numbers, providing programs multiple times, um, again, to ensure those that want to engage are able to do so. So very similar um, to some of the things that we've heard from other areas who do programming and events. Great, thank you. Will the Office of Diversity and Inclusion still be offering free printing? <laughs> yes, we will. We know that that is a crucial service for our student population, and we will. One of the 
changes, however, um, because of social distancing um, and just obviously the way our office space is set up, the number of computers that will be available, unfortunately, will be reduced. So I don't want to paint the picture that we will still have the 15 computers available for printing. So printing will look differently. Um, it'll still be an option for students, but we want to encourage students to print and go. Um, we are discussing whether or not we need to put some parameters on time limits and, and things like that, but we are evaluating, you know, how to ensure that we're able to meet the capacity needs. But yes, we will still continue to provide printing and that will be a resource for students still to 10 pages um, each day for free, of course, but that will be a service we continue to provide. Well, that sounds like great news. Thanks, Alicia. Um, <laughs> And can we still hang out in the office spaces? So uh, that is going to be a huge shift for us. Um, we, you know, evaluated, um, and obviously we know that the guidelines are shifting and changing, um, but we will not have a lounge and hangout spaces as we have known them in the past. So for our current students and returning students, um, hanging out in ODI is not going to be what it used to be. It just is not capable, we're just not capable to safely do that even with masks. And so when we look at our space, um, 12 to 15 people max in our main area. And, you know, for some that know, I mean, we have, you know, hundreds of kids coming in and out a day. And so we need to be keep safety in mind. So the lounges will be closed in our office and it will really be more of a come and go space for students. Um, again, we want to be able to tr try to provide a virtual experience for students um, to be able to connect with one another and hang out. But unfortunately, in our physical lounges, um, those will be closed and it will be really just come and go. Um, so a little different, not a little different, pretty drastically different for our space. Um, we'll miss being able to have students come in. Um, in addition, our kitchenette area that we normally have um, open and available will also be closed. So we won't have the refrigerator and microwave um, for students to be able to use. So it, that will also be a shift. We're working on a um, marketing and um, campaign to make sure that students are aware of these drastic changes. So again, follow our social media accounts, WSU Diversity on um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and we'll keep everyone up to date so that um, we, everyone knows kind of how to engage in our space for the fall semester. Yeah, thank you for that. Will you guys still be offering support groups in the fall? Yes, we will st still continue to do Phenomenal Women, Men of Excellence. We'll have our LGBTQ ambassador group, and then of course our ambassadors for diversity and inclusion. Um, and again, our academic program. So again, pr providing the same types of services, just in different types of platform. We're evaluating, um, you know, we know that some students um, want to be able to come together. And so we're looking at how do we provide like, um, you know, whether it's a, a black and yellow group or, um, you know, one, one week students might meet in person and that's going to be limited, of course, and then having students be virtual um, and coming together and then swapping so that those students that do want that experience in person can be able to do that. And so still being able to have those conversations and helping our students navigating around their identities and having conversations with faculty and staff and community members. Um, so we're looking at how we can do that. And then we also know that some students um, are going to have a virtual experience and their classes are all online. So I think it's really important for us to take that into consideration that we don't want to only offer in person or only offer virtual because we have to meet, you know, our students where they're at. And some of them, if they're all online and staying at home and they're in Western Kansas, we want them to still be able to plug into Phenomenal Women, Men of Excellence and our LGBTQ ambassador groups. And um, again, engagement will just look different, but still making sure that we're providing those connection points. Um, to have those critical conversations. Yeah, and I know our students really appreciate that. So thank you for the work that you're doing. Yeah. Um, okay, so Kevin, we have our first question about the Radigan Student Center. Um, will lounges be open in the fall? Um, as of right now, that is our goal is to have lounges open for the fall. We've been spending our summer trying to go around, spread furniture out um, to take into consideration social distancing. We just wanna make sure we're safe and the students are safe in the building. So a lot will depend on how the fall looks like and how many students we have. As you know, the Radigan Student Center is kind of a gathering spot. 
um, for everybody and students in particular. And that sort of goes against what you've got to do for social distancing and some of those kind of things. But we think we have a plan in place to be able to, to spread out that furniture. Um, we're even shrink wrapping some of the furniture in some of the spaces um, to make sure that is. And you'll see furniture in the Radigan Student Center in places you have never seen it before, just to kind of spread it out to try to get that social distancing in place. But yes, that is our goal to have lounges open for the fall. Awesome, thank you. What will tabling look like for the fall semester with social distancing in place? Well, tabling is kind of another issue. Um, we're trying to balance, again, we're trying to balance the safety along with the numbers of people in the building at one time. Um, you know, most tabling happens during lunch hours is when we're trying to feed students and we have that. If you've ever been in the Radigan Student Center over lunchtime, you can see a, a large number of people in those spaces. So what we've done with tabling and the information table is we're actually gonna suspend them for the fall semester until at least we get into it and kind of see how things are going and see what the numbers look like and then maybe look at it as we get into the semester to see whether we're able to do that in a safe manner. Yeah, that sounds that sounds great. Will office hours be changing for the building, the offices, food court, or shocker girl and lanes? Um, building hours mm -hmm. are building hours are going to change. We're going to adjust a little bit. Some of that's just depending on students and the number of students on campus and trying to kind of work some of our budgets and some of those issues with the decrease in some of our um, um, revenue that we draw on our own. Um, so building hours are going to look from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. Um, Monday through Friday, um, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. on Saturdays and then 1 to 5 on um, Sundays and each department will have hours within those groups. Shocker Sports Grill and Lanes will be like 9 a.m. till um, till 8, 8 p.m. six days a week and then closed on Sundays. Um, Shocker Store basically will be running the same hours they have this last this last year with um, 8 a.m. to 5 or 6 p.m. Um, and then Saturday hours from 11 to 3 on that side of it. Shocker Card Center will be 8 to 5 um, Monday through Friday. Um, maybe a few extra hours for for the beginning of the school year from their office hours will remain the same. So everybody will be in their offices from 8 a.m. to 5 um, p.m. five days a week from that side of it. So again, hours will start there and then we'll look to adjust. I think the big thing with us going into the semester is to be flexible. So we'll try to work with student groups and student orgs for hours beyond that and what the need is on what their on what programming will look like and some of those things. So again, try to be flexible. But we'll start there and then kind of see how the semester evolves as we go. Awesome. Well, thank you for your work in trying to make our space as safe as possible. Um, Matt, if we could move into some dining surfaces questions. What will the dining hall look like in the fall? Yeah, so our dining hall from the food and beverage aspect is going to look very similar. The biggest difference is, is when you walk into our food area in Shocker Hall, you're going to be greeted by our cashier who's going to be behind some plexiglass to create that distance. Um, we are moving to a cashless this semester, so we're just going to be accepting credit card, debit card, and then the student card. We will have our space marked one way to get through each venue that you walk to, each outlet, and then kind of one way out, so that'll be a difference. We're going to be cleaning um, as needed, but also at a minimum every 30 minutes, any high-touch spaces, and we're going to have added two to three people per shift to make sure that that cleaning happens at a high level. Another difference will be anything that you get at a station will be given to you, so you won't self-serve anymore. In our current phase, uh, which is phase three on our, our Chartwell's WSU dining side, which matches where we're at with the local um, space, is that folks will be able to take flatware and plates from our associate and then dine in. We will be at 50% capacity. So similar to what Kevin's doing in the RSC, we're going to work with him and Scott to possibly shrink wrap some tables. Uh, we just don't know if signage is going to be enough to limit students from sitting down at those tables. So we are going to identify those tables that won't be allowed to sit in to create that social distance to keep that safety piece at top of mind. You'll also see that all of our folks will be in masks. Um, they will also all be temperature checked prior to coming in uh, to create another safety uh, barrier. And then we will... Um, you know, do what we can to enforce masks in our space and encourage people to be in masks as they come in. Um, so those are the biggest things that we're doing with dining. Awesome, thank you. Um, could you talk a little bit about what happens to meal plans after we leave for break in November and what happens to meal plans when we return 
um, for the spring semester now that the year does not start until February. So what kind of the calendar will yeah. look like? So, so the meal plans will kind of function the same way. You'll still have your rollover of your dining dollars that you get with your meal plan from first to second semester. Um, the biggest change this year is because there are going to be less days that you're going to have access to Shocker Hall. We're going to add $100 each semester. So that's totally flexible cash that you can use at any of our retail brands. Um, and that would be Chick-fil-A, Starbucks, um, Freddy's. You can use that at the Ground House and then at Panda Express. And <clears throat> with our hours, our hours are pretty much staying the same from the retail side of things. The only thing we're reducing is Starbucks is going to close now at seven o'clock with the other retail brands, Monday through Friday, and then at two o'clock on Saturday, where it used to be open until six o'clock. But all other retail brands will stay the same. We are going to add hours at Ground House on Saturday and Sunday in the evening. Right now, it's just open from 7 a.m. to 10 a.m., but we are going to be opening up late night hours from eight to midnight um, to have that option if, if somebody needs to get a toiletry item or a food item um, in the evening on the weekends. Great. And what can we expect from catering in the fall? Yeah, so we're going to have a lot of options to accommodate many different events. Mo most of these options are going to try to be contactless catering. We still can do um, buffets if, if our guest wants to. We would just do those in a way where we, again, serve the meal and we social distance the guests and go through our line in a very safe way. Um, and then, again, working with the building and the facility that we're in, making sure that the tables are set in a way that create distance and space people out but we also have the option to do drop complete drop off and its own individual packaging so that the guest feels very safe that each guest will get their own meal um, and then we can do events where everything individualized as you come up to the bar and grab one item it won't be in a in a way that you're going to be touching other things so we have a lot of different options a lot of different price points and we can work and accommodate any group awesome well thank you for that that glimpse into your plan. Um, now we'll just go ahead and move into housing and residence life with Scott. So what can we expect events with housing and residence life to look like in the fall? So in housing, one of the things that we were already planning on focusing on more this year than we have in years past is more individual interactions between our student staff, the RAs in the building, um, and the students. And so them really taking time to get to know the individuals and then really, after they know what they're interested or passionate about, connecting them with events that are already happening across campus, whether it's in student involvement, ODI, or the student organizations, SGA, those type of things that are already happening and really try and connect them to those programs that are going on. Um, we will be still hosting some events um, in our building, but they'll be a little more geared towards the individual smaller communities rather than some of the building wide programs that we have done at the beginning of the year, again, just to try and avoid those large group gatherings. Great. So what happens if a student's roommate is experiencing symptoms? What is the plan to control the spread if students in the dorms are testing positive? Yeah, that's a great question. Obviously, that's probably at the top of a lot of people's concern. I mean, it's at the top of our concern as well. Um, we currently have over 100 spaces held offline where we can um, relocate individuals within housing um, to a space that only those folks will be using um, to help, again, put their mind at ease a little bit that they're not having interactions with others, um, to also keep them isolated so they're um, not coming into contact with others and potentially spreading, um, whether it's just an illness or, again, whether they're COVID positive. Um, and then Matt has agreed to work with us in terms of providing them food. So we will be able to have the students go online, um, select items uh, that um, dining services can provide, and then daily they'll bring us uh, a pile of food. I know that sounds like a weird way of describing it, but individually um, portioned uh, food for each individual, and then we'll deliver it to those folks' rooms so they're able to just stay in the room and not to have contact with other folks in the building. Um, but really the big thing is, is people are starting to experience symptoms or have questions about, you know, what should I do is we're really encouraging them to either contact student health. They've been gearing up and preparing to, to deal with students who are having concerns, symptoms, things like that, or their own personal physician um, that they use at home. So 
we're really trying to get them to the professionals as it relates to health, um, but then work to get them isolated here within our residence halls or apartments. Great. So what will happen if we have to shut down campus again with students in dorms? So similar to what we did in spring, what we do is we definitely are going to encourage people to go home. And obviously it depends what would bring the shutdown on. If it's a statewide order, you know, to, to stay at home or, or whatnot, um, we would encourage people to go home, but we are going to allow people to stay on campus if that's a need that they have. And then we would then work with our um, partners across campus to determine what is a fair way um, to compensate folks whose housing or dining have been cut short based off of that um, shutdown. And can you talk a little bit about whether students should self-quarantine when moving in? Yeah, absolutely. So the Kansas Department of Health and Environment, I believe is their full title, KDHE, provides guidelines of what students or individuals traveling from other areas in the country need to quarantine. So currently, um, they recommend it for most folks traveling internationally, as well as folk, currently people coming from Florida or Arizona. We watch that site very regularly to see when it's updated, but we have been reaching out to our students as, as early as six weeks ago to let them know about quarantine and how that's gonna work and let them know what options they have. They can come and move into our building early so that they can quarantine before classes begin. Um, so that's not disrupted for them. If they were to travel somewhere and then all of a sudden that state was added to the list, again, as I mentioned, we have these spaces held offline that students will be able to quarantine here on campus if that was something they needed to do. Could you just give a, a date that students are, are allowed to move in early or should they reach out to you or some of your staff in order to, to communicate that they'll need that early deadline? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So what we let folks know is if, if they had currently been identified as needing to quarantine, um, they could move in as early as the 25th, um, so this weekend. Uh, we don't have anyone currently coming from either Florida or Arizona, and so we don't have folks starting that early. We do have some folks who are coming um, internationally, and so we have a variety of folks moving in um, over the next week and kind of some on Monday, some on Wednesday, and some on Friday, I believe. So uh, it's just um, sporadically they're coming in. But to answer your question is, um, if they have that need or have identified that need, they can definitely contact contact our office directly and we can get information to them on how to have, them, have that happen. Awesome. So specifically within housing, uh, will social distancing and masks be enforced or are there any pro proactive measures that housing is taking within the individual rooms or, or the buildings? Yeah, we're asking people to wear masks if they're not actually in their individual rooms. So if they're um, traveling um, to class, so once they kind of enter out into the hallway um, to put that mask on, if they're heading to the dining hall to put the mask on, I know Matt has uh, expectations that he'll probably talk about in terms of how long to wear the mask in the dining hall. But basically, unless they're back in their actual individual room or apartment or suite, um, we are asking folks to wear masks at all times, as we are our staff. Awesome. Thank you for that update from housing. Um, if we could just go ahead and jump into campus recreation, I have some questions for you, John. Sure. What can we expect events to look like with campus, recre with campus recreation in the fall? Um, well, let's start with uh, intramural sports. Um, as I uh, mentioned at the beginning, at the beginning of the semester, there'll be more uh, events like tennis, single one-on-one um, -on -one type events or dual events, um, special events like punt, pass, and kick or free throw shooting contest. We're coming up a whole uh, slew of, of things that we can do. Um, you know, we have our esports hub where we can run um, esports games as well. We can do that. Um, we're going to do a lot more online wellness um, topics that our students here at Wichita uh, in the in the campus rec department are going to um, weekly give healthy um, tips on how to be uh, 
um, safe or eat healthy or work out and those types of things. So, um, you know, we're transitioning to more online, dual, individual. And then, you know, as, a, as the semester goes along, you know, we'll see how the world is and we'll adjust accordingly. Um, but we will actually have, if you count the number, we'll actually have more events than less events. We're just not having our traditional football, uh, flight football and, and volleyball at the beginning of the semester. And we're hoping we can either have them later this fall or in the spring. Yeah, hopefully. So will the hours of the Heskit change at all in the fall? And do masks have to be worn inside the Heskit? Um, the hours are going to be um, when, the, when school starts, 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., Monday through Friday, um, on Saturday, 10 to 7, and on Sunday, 1 to 8. Um, so we're going to close at one hour earlier, um, but we were planning to do that prior to COVID. Um, we just weren't getting a lot of activity between 10 and 11 at night, so not too much of a change. And as far as masks, you have to wear a mask everywhere in the Heskett Center, till you get to your activity area. And if you leave your activity area, then you have to have a mask again. So if you go to the pool, you know, you're going to wear it in the building, through the locker room and get into the pool. You can obviously take it off and go swimming. Um, in our uh, cardio spaces um, and weight room, you will need a mask before you get there. But once you get there, we spread all the machines out uh, um, six feet apart. And so you've got to work out within that social distancing uh, requirement that we've done and and the same thing in the gym you can you got to wear a mask till you get there and then if you're shooting hoops or playing badminton then you don't have to do it while you're there awesome well thank you for that update okay we'll go ahead and jump into tuition and fees with david miller david if you could just go into a little bit of why tuition went up by two percent this year sure so um I first I tell you um, I wasn't personally involved with the president when uh, he made that decision. Um, so there is some speculation, I guess, here on my part in the sense of that final decision. But um, you know, from my vantage point in and matching it up to to the budget. I really think this can be fold. Uh, one is uh, some of the budgetary options in addition to the 2.2% across the board reduction that were, was already done. Uh, I think the president viewed that as being a little bit too drastic for, for what we knew at that specific time. Um, as well as just wanting to protect the experience and the quality of the university for the students uh, because uh, when cuts occur, that also means that something that used to happen isn't going to happen any longer into the future. Um, the other thing that played out at exactly the same time of that decision uh, uh, we've been working with the board of Schnell, $1.4 million to come to the university uh, and um, unfortunately, the pandemic happened at about the exact same time in which that decision was pending as to whether that funding would be awarded or not. And unfortunately, the legislature wrapped up their session and left without awarding that $1.4 million. Um, so that also left an additional hole in the budget from what we were planning on. And I think that played a part into the president's considerations as well. Yeah, thank you for that explanation. Um, should we expect any other budget cuts that will impact our student experience this upcoming year? Uh, Kenzie, you're breaking up there a little bit. But I, I think your question was on the expecting additional budget cuts and the impact on the student experience, if I heard that right. Yeah. And I think I want to try and address that kind of twofold, if I could. Uh, one, kind of looking at the SGA student fee budget, but first looking at the larger university budget. And in my introduction, I kind of mentioned that for fiscal year 21, that we just wrapped up that budget and that uh, as a foundation for going forward, I think that we're in pretty good shape. So in, in the sense of additional cuts occurring in 
fiscal year 2021, I don't believe that will be the case. But two for the larger university budget, uh, we, we are experiencing some headwinds now. And, and just to elaborate, a few weeks ago, we uh, received news from the governor's budget office that she was going to exercise her right to do an allotment um, which sounds like um, an allotment sounds like you're getting additional funds, but in reality, it's a it's a budget reduction. And what the state did for fiscal year 2021 was uh, to uh, essentially swap, if you will, 2.9 million dollars in state general fund allocation to the university with federal funds that the that the state received called the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund uh, that. And, COVID. and so for 2021, that's not a big deal because essentially they're swapping those two sources of funds and we still receive $2.9 million in order to support the university, even though the source of those funds now is different. But moving into fiscal year 22, uh, we heard from the governor's budget office that uh, that $2.9 million is unlikely, at least at this early stage of the budget process, doesn't look like it will be restored. So for fiscal year two, uh, we know that it's possible that we'll have a $3 million uh, rounded up uh, reduction uh, to kick off that budget process. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Governor's Budget Office asked every state agency to submit what's called a reduced resource package. And they asked for that package uh, to be submitted in the range of a 10% reduction, uh, which for Wichita State is $8 million, in addition to the $3 million that I just referenced. And um, we, we, we need to be cautious in how we kind of view that because uh, what the state is actually asking for right now is they're essentially saying, if the governor or if the legislature had to cut your budget by 10%, how would you do it and what would be the impacts of those, those uh, changes in your operations? So they're not saying that that is going to happen. They're just asking for what the information would look like to occur. Uh, so that will still need to play out through uh, the state budget process um, for fiscal year 22, which honestly won't wrap up until uh, kind of May of 2021. So it's a long, it's a long game, and uh, there's a there's a lot of time for this to play out, and a lot of things can easily change from where we are today to where we will be in May of uh, 21. But in, in the sense of state funding for uh, fiscal year 2022, um, it, it doesn't look good, at least so far right now. Uh, for credit hours in the tuition side of the university's budget, uh, things look pretty well, and they're aligned uh, pretty well with what our estimates were uh, when we built the 21 budget. So we got a good foundation there. Um, so that's kind of the view on the larger university's budget. Another thing I wanted to touch on is just the SGA and their student fees committee and that budget, which is about $10 million. Um, at the end of the process last year, uh, SGA uh, voted and elected to hold their fee flat. And so the majority of the budgets that are funded through uh, SGA and that $10 million already, already received a a modest, if you will, uh, budget decrease from previous years. Uh, but what we haven't done is align the SGA budget with the expectations of uh, uh, the potential and That will be based largely on the fall credit hours and, and student enrollment that we see uh, once the fall session kicks off. And we'll do a reevaluation of the revenue estimates that drive that budget and bring that to SGA uh, for them to, to weigh and consider if there is a need for additional cuts in 2021. Uh, but right now, it's a little bit too early to tell until um, we get into classes actually kicking off and we can uh, more um, 
specifically see what the level of students, student enrollment is, the type of students that have enrolled, and uh, recalculate those revenue estimates. Great, thank you, David. Um, is there oh, any way that... Oh, sorry. <laughs> thank you, David. No, go ahead. That you could give us a, a brief idea about which services are prioritized under the new budget? For, t tell me a little bit more. For this year, I believe is what the question is trying to get at. If if not, that's okay. If that question doesn't make sense. Yeah. Well, um, I I guess what I uh, maybe that might be a lead in to another answer that may or may not be helpful. But uh, so for the twenty twenty one budget, um, the the university addressed part of the shortfall by doing an across the board two percent budget reduction that I mentioned before, which generated about two point six million dollars in savings. Uh, when you do an across-the-board budget reduction, uh, the budget office isn't necessarily privy to how the individual areas, private, uh, prioritize how those cuts would be implemented. Um, so, um, to to try, so I can't I can't really answer that question because I, I don't necessarily know how the lower level individual areas prioritize those cuts. What I would tell you though is if and this is just from my own vantage point, if it's helpful, when we move into fiscal year 2022, because we've done a number of across the board budget cuts for the last couple of years, I think that's gonna be a lot harder to do in the future. And so if the state cuts that I mentioned before do occur, and we have to make some relatively significant cuts into fiscal year 22, I, I would foresee those being much more strategic and prioritized and maybe even using a practice like the state is with their reduced resource package that's being submitted or being considered. So um, I, I think in the future, we can definitely uh, look at being able to answer that question of how things were prioritized when cuts were made. Uh, but for 2021 and the way those cuts were made, uh, I can't answer that. Okay, yeah, thank you for that insight. Um, before I get into this next question, I just wanted to preface with, um, as it was explained to me, the classes that have now been, that have been moved online, the online fee for the class has been frozen since June 26th. So if a class moves online after June 26th, it will not be, an online fee will not be added. Um, so that it, that's how that was explained to me. Do you happen to know what the specific, why the specific date of June 26 was chosen to freeze the online student fee? Yeah, I did ask uh, Academic Affairs that in the, the department that runs the online program. And what they outlined for me was that that was really tied to uh, the deadline for when bills need to be distributed and sent. So uh, it, it wasn't really tied to anything else other than that. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. We're, we're out of time. And so it's time to wrap up. Um, for the questions that we did not get to, SGA will be taking those questions and finding answers to them and follow up with the individual students. Um, I would also like to say thank you to everyone who submitted questions today and tuned in for the virtual town hall. Thank you to our panelists. I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, I do want to just quickly clarify because there were some questions and comments about this in the chat. We just want to remind our students that masks will be required while you are on campus unless you're outside by yourself or in an office alone. So we encourage you to, pre to prepare and have a mask before you come to campus. If you do not have one, there will be a limited amount of masks available for students at the RSC information desk and the Shocker support locker and at Shocker Hall as well. Um, as we begin the upcoming semester, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of these individuals or myself if you have any further questions or concerns. Thank you to all of our panelists once again who joined today, and thank you for tuning in. I hope you all stay happy, safe, and healthy. And remember, we're all Shockers United. Please continue to check your student email and make sure you're up to date on, on what fall is going to look like, and just keep it up. Thank you, guys.